Hello, and uh, welcome to another Twitch session. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about 2D animation, and uh, I'm going to be demonstrating a 2D animation take and talking a little bit about a scene that's in progress, and something new today. Um, so if you're interested in 2D animation, if you're interested in animation takes, if you like cats, um, cat animals that means, not the movie, um, you're in the right place. Well, hello there, John Skull. Nice to see you. Um, as always, I'm always curious to know whether or not you guys can see in here. So uh, if you'd be so kind as to let me know that you can see this and hear this all right, I will start going to town on the new scene that I'm working on. Um, if anything's wrong technically, please don't be shy. Just let me know and I'll uh, try to fix it before going on and on because you don't want to miss a thing, right? Um, so, just checking in. Ah, great. Nice to know. Thank you, Renato. Nice to see somebody from Facebook. Um, if I haven't mentioned this in links or anything, if it's not obvious, um, you can join us on Facebook. You can join us on YouTube. This entire thing is being presented by CG Spectrum. College of Digital Art and Animation, where you can learn all sorts of amazing things about CG arts, uh, CG computer graphics, um, so modeling and uh, character design, concept art and animation, and Maya, and it just goes on and on. Unreal Engine, that's a hot topic these days, right? And uh, games, game design, game creation, uh, different aspects of game work, but physical, hands on stuff, um, getting your hands dirty with CG. Uh, works um, with a variety of programs and a variety of experts our mentors um, are uh, called from some of the best studios and worked on some of the best stuff around so um, yeah check it out cgspectrum.com and so uh, I've already got some comments welcome hey nice to see you is the sponge Bob square Spongebob Squarepants on the run. Is it a hybrid animation movie? I don't know. I'm actually, I'm sorry to report that I don't know. I guess I've been stuck in my uh, cavern and I haven't been paying attention too much. I know that there is a Spongebob movie, but I don't know if it's uh, a hybrid. And so if anybody knows that, I'd be curious. I'd, I'd love to find out myself. Um, and I know that the first one was really popular. And uh, so, um, yeah, I'd be curious to know what's going on with the, the new Spongebob. I know there's a new Tom and Jerry cartoon because I have a credit and I'm not working on it, but other than that. And uh, speaking of which, so this is what I'm going to be working on today. Um, this is a scene that I've actually done for CG Spectrum as part of the classes that we teach. Uh, so for the 2D animation class, uh, one of the things that we have students do is they do a animation take. I'm supposed to say squeaky yeah, hack, I figured it out. It's okay. <laughs> it's SpongeBob Square Pants. I know I used to say Square Pants, Square Bob Sponge, I don't know, whatever. I'm, it's a little uh, early, a little beyond my time. By the time SpongeBob came out, I was a little too old for it, I'm afraid. But when I've seen it, I've, I've enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. I've not seen the movie though, the first one. So, so yeah, so I'm just going to be working on this scene today. I uh, will uh, turn off the cleanup pass here and just let you see what it looks like. So this is uh, what the scene looks like. Just sort of a generic classic take. Um, let me make it a little bit darker so you can actually see it a little bit better. So I just bump up the opacity a little so you can see uh, the actual animation a little bit better. Make sure that it all looks pretty and uh, this is what the final rough animation looks like. So um, in talking about doing a character take, the very first thing that I would do, let me get this out of the way here, just hide that. The very first thing that I would do is think of inspiration. My inspiration came from O'Malley, the Elliot Cat, who was a Disney character that I thought was really cool. Um, I saw this movie when I was very little, but uh, um, really enjoyed it and thought it was cool. And so 
Um, the character that I decided to do this scene with was uh, based on this Disney character. It's not verbatim, it's not exactly this character, which would be cheating or stealing or something like that. It's just school of Disney cat circa 1970s, um, Milk Call inspired. My name's Hyun scale next to your drive, way of tracking blocking. Scale next to your drive, way of tracking blocking. I'm not 100% sure what that question means, Morgan Shark. Sorry, it's, is hand drawing scale next to your drawing a way of tracking blocking? Um, I will say this, <laughs> since I'm not quite sure what to, I'm not quite sure what the question is. But um, as far as this goes, uh, I certainly blocked it out um, using a variety of techniques before I actually drew this out i did a rough version of it that looks like this and i have no shame in showing it let me get these cats out of the way uh, and show you just where this started with where this started from um, this is this was my first pass with this and this was actually probably my second pass my first pass was even rougher than this and what i was doing was blocking out shapes not very well as it turns out now that i look at this it's all over the place it's kind of a mess but the, the idea was not to make this look beautiful the idea was to get the timing of it. Um, and uh, even before I did this pass, I actually began with thumbnails, uh, which looked like this. So I had my inspiration, which was the cat um, from Disney. And then I said, oh, I want to do a classic tape. Well, I could even go a step further. Before that, there was Richard Williams. Uh, I used the Richard Williams book as an inspiration. I'm gonna go ahead and blow that up a little bit bigger so you can see it better. Um, but you can also find this online. Yeah, I guess it's as big as we want it to be. Um, and this is, uh, you know, the classic take style, which is you've got one character um, in a neutral pose, goes down into a squish pose, goes up into a stretch pose, and then back down into a neutral pose. That is the bare minimum that you would do for a take is just uh, those four poses. So um, that is actually where I started from. I wanted to do this as a lesson for my students. So I actually uh, began with looking at Richard Williams and started from there. Uh, the question, playing animation, there was a line with some numbers next to the drawing. That was sort of, ah, yes, um, I'm going to talk about that. That's an excellent question. Thank you, Morning Shark. Um, that's a great question to ask. I was going to mention a little bit about what that was I was showing you. Um, what I was showing you were charts. Uh, again, this is probably too small. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger and you guys can see uh, my charts and I'll just cover up my face. It doesn't really matter. At least you can see the numbers. Um, these numbers, these charts, are showing you the timing of my animation scene. Notice in the lower right hand corner it says 42, hold for four frames. Um, up in the left hand corner it says hold one through nine. And then there's a special chart for the eyes. So this is how I was charting my scene um, so I could get the timing of it just right. Now, the way I work is I do the animation first and then I do the charts afterwards. Um, so, in this case, the first thing that I came up with was the thumbnails. Let me show that again. I'm going to hide this. First things first was the thumbnails, and then um, I was looking at Richard Williams to try and get some inspiration about how I should time it out. And then once I did that, then I went ahead and did my rough pass that I had on the screen just a minute ago. And. Um, once I'd played around with my rough past and worked out some of the issues, um, again, this is just based on Richard Williams. Let's see if I can put them up, both up at the same time. Um, there you go. You can see that all I did really was put in those four poses and then do a couple breakdowns here and there uh, to sort of get the feel of it. And then I had already decided I wanted to do O'Malley or something like that, a Disney cat. Um, but I had that handy while I was um, doing the animating. So I'm get rid of that. And get rid of that. Um, and then once I'd done the rough pass, which is probably in here somewhere, there's a, a pre-tie-down rough version. 
of this. Um, once I did that, then uh, I was able to go in and uh, chart it out here. Uh, that's actually my cleaner version. You can see it's it's still blocking. It's not uh, in between. It's not fleshed out very well, but um, but it's still those basic poses. And you can see this mess down here on the bottom of my screen. Um, I'll turn myself off for just a sec so you can see uh, my screen a little better. Um, you can see all those red ticks and blue ticks. Um, that is uh, showing you the keys and breakdowns. The keys are red, the breakdowns are blue. And each one of these is a specific separate pass. The charts themselves I put on a pass all their, their own because I wanted the uh, drawings to hold for as long as the key lasts. So if the key goes from one to nine, then my next one is on nine. The keys from nine to 17, I wanna go all the way to 17 before I um, do another chart. And you can see I drew these by hand. I also, I'm gonna confess something. I actually changed my charts because once I started in betweening it, I wasn't happy with the timing and I made some editorial choices. But the charts are basically telling you, let me draw in here, um, that basically 34 is a key and 42 is a key. Those are key poses. And then 36 is one half. The drawing is one half between 39 and 42. Let me do this with my pencil, it'll be easier. So in other words, if I've got a ball that looks like this, and then I've got a ball that looks like that, and this is 39, and this is 42, then my ball that's halfway between those will look something like this. And that's an in-between. That is an in-between that is approximately halfway. It's halfway in terms of space, right? So if this is one, two, three, it's 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 right here halfway between. And then shape-wise, the first one was a perfect, well, a very rough sphere. The third one was an elongated egg exaggeration ball. And then the one in the middle, the in-between is uh, halfway between those two. If I was really doing it for real, then I'd also plot the size of it and make sure that the size hits the edge. If I was doing it in 3D space, then I'd plot the arc of it a little bit better. Um, but that is what that chart is telling us is uh, the timing of my animation. What's halfway between, what's halfway between that, and on and on and on. Uh, in this case with the chart, um, one of the things that I was doing was I'm plotting a slow out or slow coming to a stop basically uh, so you can see that it's halfway here 36 is halfway 38 is halfway again 40 is halfway again and each one of those are on twos that means so it's two frames two 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 but each frame is getting a little bit closer together to the point where it finally is barely even moving that's the idea anyway and so that's what this chart is saying and that's um, why you do charts is because if i want to follow myself up and you know attack the scene again in at a sh later date or if you're lucky enough to have a crew that's going to follow you up and do your in-betweens for you and do cleanup or do rough in-betweens on your behalf then they need to have some roadmap as to what your uh, path was when you were animating so um, so, well, thank you, Oscar. Uh, thanks. I'm happy to show off the steps. And uh, the chart is more for remembering where the drawing is in relation to that movement. Yes, that is exactly what the chart's doing, is it's, it is your roadmap for the scene and telling you where you went faster or slower um, in your scene. So if, if I look at the final again, um, again, these charts are wrong. So the charts for five to 17, this is uh, frame 17 here. It's, it's, all, it's all different. But you can see, if I look through this, um, from the frame five where it stopped to here, there was a halfway point and that's the halfway point. And that's uh, why I marked it designated with a breakdown. You can see that on my screen. Hopefully you can see it on my screen that it's a tick in blue. And that's where my cursor is right now. And that means it's halfway between here, which is this one, and here. So the head was turning from here to here. And this is a halfway point. So now if I just click on those three, um, I'm going to try and click on frames themselves. This wasn't working earlier. So 
uh, I might not use it, but you should be able to, yeah, it's not working. So um, click just on those three frames, you can see that that's the initial move. These are my two key poses here and here, and then halfway between those is here. So that's just a way of plotting this out and, and remembering what I did, when I did it, and why. Uh, and you can see there are lots and lots and lots of ticks, red ones and blue ones. The only ones I'm concerned with right now uh, are the cat take final, which is then going to become the cleanup pass. Um, so by the time I've gotten to this version of it, I have hopefully eliminated any question, any doubt. And now I'm just going through and I'm going to do all the cleanups for the cat and then all the uh, uh, in-betweens as well. You know, turn myself on again here because I know you don't want to miss my smiling face. Um, but so uh, this initial pass, this is what it looked like without any in-betweens. It was just a series of drawings that I first roughed out and then I cleaned up a little bit here. You can see it's cleaner. And then I went through an in-between bit and filled on the drawings based on those charts, based on these charts that you see up here. Uh, I went through and in between it, and that's how I ended up with what you see on the screen right now. Any questions? I know I just kind of breezed through that a little bit, but um, yeah. So the in between is anything that's between the keys. So if we go back and look at the keys, you can see that you know there's a wide division between this drawing and this drawing. In order to make this look more smooth, I have to add more drawings. So I start by adding a half. A drawing that goes halfway between, in this case, a drawing that favors the top one. I don't know if that's charted correctly. You know, it's all, I'll, I'll just chart it again just for laughs. So the drawing is 19, and then the next key is 23. 19 to 23, and then there's a halfway point, which is 21, which is not exactly half. So in order to plot this, I would say, turn this back on, it's it's going to look like this. 19 is a key, 23 is a key, and then the drawing in between, which was 21, is a favor, or actually is a favor to the other side, is a favor to 19. It's actually closer to 19 than it is to 25. 25 or 20, 23, yeah. So it looks something like this. You might call this a quarter. If it's important, then you would even write next to the chart and say it's a quarter. I always do my uh, charts on another layer or another page so that you can get rid of it or just do it outside of the drawings. Um, but it would look something like that. So um, yeah, that's what that's for. Uh, so, yeah, just make sure this, start with your keyframes. Yep, start with your keyframes, which are the dynamic positions. Excellent, yeah. Then do the in-betweens of those keys. You'll basically double everything. Well, think about it this way. Um, when I did these drawings, which were keys, and don't count that first one, but the cleanup one, but we'll um, just get rid of that for now. Um, when I did these, so these were my extremes, then I went through and I said, okay, well, how do I break this down further so that it's smoother? So this was my first pose, and then, well, actually that technically was the first pose, and then I went down into a squish pose, and then I went up into an extreme pose, and then back down into a settle, which was two parts. Settle here and settle there. And I'll be fixing that when I do a cleanup version, that's for sure. So those were my first key initial poses based on just plotting it out. Then I went and broke it down. That's why these blue things are called breakdowns, the blue tick ones. So between here and here, I broke it down halfway like so. And then between here and here, I broke it down like so. And then between here and here, broke it down, et cetera, et cetera. You get the gist. And then once I did that, then I broke it down even further to make it look more smooth. The idea is, <laughs> thanks, JD. Appreciate it. Um, thanks for complimenting the cat. Um, the, the idea is, is you want it to look as smooth as you possibly can. Now, I ended up doing a lot of this on ones just because when I looked at it, I was like, hmm. I want this to kind of have a Disney feel to it. I want it to be smooth. And when it's cleaned up, it will look really sweet. That's the idea. Um, and so uh, the idea is that um, I'm shooting for 
kind of naturalism, kind of realism. When you're doing animation, when you're doing movies, your goal is to not give away the secret, which is this is all just a bunch of still drawings that are being flashed in front of your face. And because of persistence of vision, we dumb humans, <laughs> we, uh, no, I didn't mean that. Um, we uh, see it as moving at speed and, and it, it gives us the illusion that we're actually looking at um, something that's uh, alive and not just when individual doing drawings. Oh, doing now you can hear me twice. Hold on. Not Sorry. Give away the secret. Sorry, guys. Anyway, um, so so th that's why I'm adding more and more drawings. Different styles of different animation, like, for example, anime, which we all love, right? Um, they don't necessarily feel the need to use that many drawings. Um, maybe they'll use them for the effects or for special sequences or things, but they don't necessarily have them uh, constantly going on twos, or, or in this case, on like a mine on ones. In my case, um, they're actually uh, a lot of drawings on ones. So uh, that was just a choice. That was just something that I decided to do. And uh, so off we go. Now I have a whole bunch of questions on YouTube. I was neglecting my friends on YouTube before, so uh, I'm just checking in some just double checking that just so you guys know so anyway um yes yeah, so the in-betweens are not necessarily just halfway you can put them anywhere you like and uh, in terms of timing but um so so for example let me just show you an example of something that's a little bit different in terms of in-betweens so uh, actually, I was looking at that one. So if you look at this one from here to here, what would halfway be? Halfway would probably be about right here. This would be the halfway point between those two. Actually, it looks like I did this one on quarters. Um, so it's actually favoring the down uh, position a little bit more. So just ignore this chart. These charts are wrong. This, these um, were for a, an earlier iteration of it. Oh, it's locked up. Never mind. Um, but yeah, just ignore those charts. Those don't have bearing on what um, we're doing. If I was to chart this for real, I probably would do it Well, I just did it a minute ago, but um, I would continue on from here and go, okay, so the first one is 19, the last one's 23. There are three drawings in between. The first one was a favor to the upside. That's a terrible drawing. The second one's a favor to the, the next bottom one down, or maybe this one's a half. Let's just double check and look. That might actually qualify as a halfway point. Um, but just in for, to keep it all straight so it's easier to see, I'll just do it like this. So it would be like this. 19, 23, I'm sorry, 23. These are the keys. And then this first in between was a favor. And then the second one was kind of a favor as well. So that was 19, 21. And then this one's 22 and then 20 fits in there neatly. So uh, basically this is on thirds. And then this one was on halves. You don't necessarily have to write in one third, one third, one half. I know people who don't chart at all. I don't know why they would not want to do that. I, do, I have my beginner students not worry too much about the charts at first. Just learn how to animate and then you can go back and document what, how you animated. But at a certain point, you must create charts because how else will you know what your thinking was? Um, even now, I mean, you're watching me do this. I'm going back after the fact and going, no, wait, what did I do again? Think about how much time this is taking uh, to sort of replot this and rechart this. If I'd done due diligence in the first place, actually, I mean, I have my charts somewhere. I just don't have them available. Um, then you you would see that it's like, okay, now I'll only have to go through here and just do the animation. Um, you know, just start cleaning it up and I'm all set. Or I could hand it off to someone and go, okay, just follow my charts, you're good. So it's very important that you pay some attention to charts at some point. That's the only thing that matters. More complex or even subtle movement animations, how do you identify where each key is, is where each character is pausing? So if you take a look at that rough version I did, so this is a question about, um, well, how do you know where your uh, extremes are? If you take another look at this version, which is the rough one, um, the idea was the extremes. So remember, I looked at uh, Richard Williams and I said, well, I know that I've got to have one where the character's resting 
and I've got to have one where the character squishes down, then one where the character goes a little too far. Here's two of them actually, and then it has to settle. Where did I get that? Well, I, again, I got it from Richard Williams, who kindly you know, mapped it out for us and uh, maps out different kinds of takes and shows you how you might exaggerate your character. Look at that mouse. Uh, if you see the mouse about half, three quarters of the way down the page, you know, look how much exaggeration there is on the ears and things. So you don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, this has all been done and it's been done many times before. It's a line for Peter Pan, I think. Um, so you just have to kind of figure out you know, what your character looks like and uh, how big or broad you want it to be and then um, go to town and start plotting it. I always say, just get in there and start playing around, rough it out. And that's why I say don't do the charts first, is because uh, you need to play. You need to have fun and, and scribble and, and come up with stuff. What this is the book that I got this from. So Richard Williams, uh, Animator's Toolkit. Um, I'm pretty sure that's where I got this from. Uh, if not, there's plenty of stuff in there that you can get. Uh, that's of equal importance. Um, okay, so I'm just pulling it up so you guys can see it. Uh, I talk about these books all the time. Uh, Animator Survival Kit. Sorry, I said it wrong. There you go. So just type in Animator Survival Kit and you will see. Let me get this out of the way. And you'll be able to see uh, just if you type in Animator Survival Kit. He's also done videos and things and um, he covers all sorts of stuff. Another one that you might want to check out is uh, Preston Blair. Preston Blair does animation books. So if you just type in Preston Blair animation, you'll see uh, his books. You'll see his animation. There you go. Cartoon animation with Preston Blair. A lot of this stuff is really old school. It's a lot of old um, technique stuff. And I've said this before and I'll say it many times. Um, to whoever wants to listen, things have changed. You know, we've, we've gotten more sophisticated. The, the age of uh, CG animation has made animation in general much more sophisticated. And so uh, it's good to keep that in the back of your mind as you're going through some of the old style stuff. And also too, they they were working with stereotypes in the olden days. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Morning shark for, uh, for chiming in with that. Um, and, and there's, also issues of um, old stereotypes have come and gone. You know, they were playing to the cheap seats in the back when they came up with animation in the olden days. It's very much for vaudeville. That's what I mean by cheap seats. It's like if you only had a penny, you could sit in the back of the theater and you could still see the show. So the people on stage had to play it very broadly and had to uh, um, uh, make sure that they were making it read for everybody in the back. And that's where the original style of animation that Disney used and Fleischer's and other studios, um, they were, everybody went to see theater. That was the cultural nadir that you could do back in the olden days. And uh, movies were still kind of like, what is this? And, and oh, that's for like low class people who can't afford theater. And, and it's for lowbrow entertainment, vaudeville style, you know, pratfalls and gags and stuff. And so uh, the style of animation that was common in the 30s, 40s, 50s, all the way up through the 70s was based in theater and broad cartooning. Well, things have changed. We've gotten a lot more sophisticated. If you see a film like Klaus, you'll see just how sophisticated things have gotten, much more subtle, much more um, delicate. And uh, it was, they were capable of doing that all along. There's nothing more delicate than some of the scenes in Bambi and Pinocchio and, and uh, you know, a lot of great films that were made then. And certainly again, anime, you know, it's, it doesn't get any more delicate than some of that stuff, but the style is sort of based on um, vaudeville. And so that's just something that I like to point out. Um, that's what, these books are, are hearkening back to that era and not necessarily talking about the more delicate stuff that we do nowadays. Um, but anyway, but yes, I highly recommend Richard Williams and a Preston player in the whole game. That's great stuff. There's a question back a little while ago. I wanted to hit that one just to make sure. Don't want to miss anything. Um, and you can also ask a, a question again too if if uh, if I missed something and you wanted to ask something. 
So just checking a couple comments. Um, yeah, so those books are still helpful for today's animation. Uh, highly recommended. Um, even Illusion of Life, I talk about that one all the time. Uh, you can check out Frank and Ollie, uh, the beautiful coffee table book that they created, which was my first animation book in 1984. Uh, and it's full of beautiful stuff, beautiful anecdotes, and technical stuff too. So um, yes, and then uh, Eric Goldberg is an amazing animator, still working today. One of the living legends in animation. I got to work with him tangentially at Disney. And uh, he's got uh, some great stuff to do. Now, one thing that they don't talk about enough, maybe in these books, I feel, is the value of being able to draw. And um, you're, if you, <laughs> you're selling CG animation with CG Spectrum, if, if you like motion, if you like animating motion and breathing life into characters and things, you might be better off doing CG animation. You also might be better off doing cutout style 2D animation, which is where you have a cutout rig. Um, it's a program that we're about to launch at CG Spectrum for the fall is uh, what you see in TV animation a lot, where it, I didn't actually draw this character over and over and over on every frame. The character has a little puppet rig and I'm developing a uh, stream on that eventually. I'll, I'll show off a character. We haven't got it finished yet, but um, I will uh, talk about that in future Twitch streams. And that's for people who eh, maybe you don't like to draw every single frame. Uh, but for the rest of us mere mortals, I mean, I like doing it all. So, but, but for some people, the drawing is the thing. And whether or not you're actually drawing every frame and, and breathing life into the character or a single drawing at a time, that uh, that's, uh, you know, it's slightly different disciplines. And uh, I think I was probably a little bit better at CG animation than I was at 2D. But again, I love it all. And I love uh, cutout stuff. So the, the yeah, the for JD asking about which program we're going to do it in. We're uh, exclusively doing Toon Boom. As of this fall, we will have a certification in Toon Boom. So that will be one of the benefits of going with us is we'll have a, a Toon Boom certification um, qualification as of this fall. <laughs> what it's, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, so we're going to be working with that and creating, you know, not so much creating the rigs, we'll create rigs, um, but we'll have rigs that you can play with. And uh, so if you prefer to animate that way in 2D, uh, we'll be talking all about that in the fall coming up. Um, so, yeah, so just to sort of comment on those, is it vector-based? Mm, yes. Uh, technically speaking, I mean, when I think of vector base, I think of the way that the characters were created. So it's like, you know, we created a head and a body and a, um, but, but as opposed to animate CC, which is the Adobe version, um, you're not necessarily breaking all those things into components and then rotating them uh, with a rig underneath. You're actually creating a skeletal rig for those characters and animating it the same way that you would CG animation. So I don't know if uh, technically I would call that vector based at that point. Um, but the design of them, I mean, it was created that way. And it's it's close to uh, Animate CC, but it's not exactly the same thing. It's a lot more complicated and uh, thereby a lot more interesting to look at. <laughs> uh, but it still takes a lot of work. I, I say that to my students uh, all the time is there is no easy way around the fact that um, you have to be able to draw at some point, you know, or get people to draw for you. But if you can draw, it, it's helpful. But think about it with a rig system, you draw the character one time and then you can make it move around, you know, using puppet controls. I hope somebody records that so they'll make a gif out of me going like this. Um, by contrast, though, that's all you'll get. If you want to have different angles, if you want to have different attitudes, character poses, you have to draw those. So, yes. So uh, to um, repeat what Oscar said, uh, draw as much as you can. Yeah, take classes. Draw from real life. Um, draw with a mentor. Uh, our, I believe, um, I believe the one of our mentors, the one that does con concept art, you do life drawing with them. Uh, also, in our class in 2D, you do some life drawing, but it's kind of assumed that you've done some drawing already. 
and that you you understand that animation is a lot of drawing, and uh, um, that's we, we kind of hope that that's a given when you start. But we take out we take people from the ground up. If you don't uh, if you don't know how to draw necessarily, we'll try to make you better. So we can't make you excellent, but we can make you better. Uh, a couple things. Um, well, Oscar, I'm great. I think it's great that you love to draw and. Um, yeah, you know, put your stuff out there. If you're looking for feedback, uh, go on a Facebook group, which looks like that's where you are right now. Go on Facebook and find a group. There are 2D animation groups. All you have to do is type in 2D animation. You'll find groups. I'm on a couple of them. Put stuff out there. Be brave and just say, hey, I want feedback and uh, take the good with the bad and take uh, all comers and sift through the this, this stuff and, and figure out what you think is uh, helpful. Um, so Toon Boom, is it the best? I don't know if Toon Boom is the best. What I love about Toon Boom is this. I've shown this before. Uh, but if I'm in here drawing, let me pull up a cleanup drawing in progress or something. Uh, let's see. Well, we'll use this one. Anyway, um, what I can do is, is I can turn my drawings like it's a disc. And I have the ability to uh, use this as if it's a disc. And then even better than that, Let's say I've got uh, these two drawings, and uh, we need the X sheet. I think you do you need the X sheet to do this. You haven't done it in a while. So I'll do this real quick, show you how this works, because I think it's the coolest thing ever. And this is uh, exclusive to Toon Boom. It's why we are using it. So if I'm on this layer, so I've got these drawings. I'll send these two drawings uh, to the desk. Um, then. If I go into the onion skin mode, you can see the two drawings on top of each other. And then if I, God, I'm not set up for this today, sorry. If I pull up the tools I need, um, then I can start to, I can take them off the disc basically. So, so they're around here somewhere. Oh, oof, I should have gotten them. Yeah, they're here. It's, it's all set up. I just haven't you know, put it in this view. There we go. Okay, so now um, I have the ability to turn on these tools. And if I zoom out, you can see I can take drawings. Unfortunately, that's not showing my drawing. Um, but I can take drawings off. Oh, I didn't draw anything. That's why. So let me just um, draw something real quick and you'll see how it works. La -dee -dee. So I can take that off of the pegs and move it. See how I'm moving this around? And then I can rotate it too. This is kind of funky. I was doing this in another lesson not too long ago and I actually got it to cooperate, but it's it can be kind of funky. Anyway, there we go. So I can rotate the drawing. And now let's say I want to trace off the cat's face. Uh, I'll get rid of that. I'll just do this really fast. I don't know if you're that interested in it or not actually just cut it and then draw it so let's say I'm gonna draw the cat's face like so and then put it back on the pegs um, well first of all I can just check in the camera and you can see see do you see uh, if I turn on the off the onion skin you'll see it better you see how the cat's face is crooked well that's because I rotated it in this view I can rotate it any old way I like um, and then try to match volumes that way. So let's turn back, I need the skin back on and uh, I'll rotate it now so it's a little bit closer. Um, but so this is one of the benefits of working with Toon Boom is that they have this and my understanding anyway is that they, uh, uh, this was the big selling point when they were selling Toon Boom in the first place is it has the ability to, to do this. You can see it's it's not foolproof, at least on mine it isn't. Um, there we go, so I'm trying to now, and I'm gonna try and rotate this back and uh, you know, say, oh, well, I want his face to be just a little bit crooked, not quite as crooked as it was that time. So I'm basically shifting and tracing. It's, it's the equivalent of taking drawings off of a peg on a light board and then placing them uh, on top of each other and then I could compare the sizes. So if I'd already drawn the, I mean, I didn't set up to do this today, so it's not quite as obvious, but 
uh, now you can see my uh, cat's face is like, okay, so I've got it lined up perfectly, so it's going to be a perfect duplication of the cat's face, right? Now if I go back to the original drawings, it's still sitting there on the pegs. I didn't change anything. Um, the drawing's actually uh, still sitting there. And so now if I wanted to, I could go in and I could flesh out the rest of it. You know, and just draw the rest of the cat body and have the cat's face uh, slightly crooked in this curious pose. And then if I turn off the onion skinning, you can see that I can flip, well, let me turn this off. I can flip between my two drawings and you can see that, you know, now the cat's doing a little move. It's, it's actually uh, tilting its head. And so that's one of the benefits of using Toon Boom, Boom is this uh, ability that you have to, uh, to shift and trace, to, to take drawings off the pegs. And that's what you're looking at down here. Uh, this goes back to the old animation days. This is a cylinder and then these are two squares. And if you've ever seen animation paper, old school, you can still buy it from a like, cartoon color company. Uh, it, if you've got hole punched paper, then it'll have these two uh, holes here and then a hole here. And that's how we used to register animation. And then uh, we would draw, you know, in this area. And then you'd flip using the corners. Um, then you put the whole thing on an animation disc. Well, actually, I can do that better. The animation disc looked something like this, and it had a registration mark here. Um, and it would have pegs. And you'd stick the paper on the pegs. And um, then the reason you're seeing this, uh, you can see, if I can draw in here or not now, because it's set up, you can see the, the whole and the two pegs, and then the disc. Well, this is set up just like an old-fashioned animation disc. And then I have the ability to rotate my entire scene as if it's a disc with a light table. So um, that's just um, trying to replicate that is why we have these uh, pegs and holes down here. And then again, um, you have the ability to rotate the drawings and move them. And that's one of the benefits of using Toon Boom. So, there's my little pitch for, for Toon Boom. Um, so yeah, yeah, you know, give it a try. I think that they have a, an, a student version of Toon Boom that you can try it out and see if you like it or not. When you're in CG Spectrum, I believe they pay for it or they wrote, they compensate you for it and you, you get the student rate anyway, so it's, it's not too expensive. Uh, so I've got some questions here. Let me just check and see. Um, yeah, so that's my answer with Toon Boom. I don't know if it's the best, but it's it's good. It's really good, and it does that. So, uh, has it been an instance in a project where the beginning of the scene has changed, and you had to alter animation, but link it back up some later in the scene that you already made? Yes, uh, Morning Shark. That happens constantly. Uh, well, did I don't know now, but um, we were constantly having to go back and uh, hook things up that didn't match, and they'd say, "Oh, well, can you make this bigger leap now, or can you make this a small crawl?" Trying to think of any examples. I know that with um, uh, Miguel on, on Road to El Dorado, there was a whole business where he had a mask on and he had a mask with arrows. And we had to go back and, and do all that over again and do it with his face instead of with the arrows. But yet it would match up with certain scenes. And yeah, we had to uh, compensate for a lot of that stuff. Um, so it happens all the time where halfway through the scene they go, okay, now from this point on, could you make the character do something else? Uh, so yeah, that's one of the joys actually of hand-drawn animation is just think about it. If I was going along and doing a scene and award-winning drawings from me, right, um, on, this, on the fly, but I'm doing a scene and my character is going like this and then I want it to suddenly you know, go like this and then the, 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 the uh, director or whoever, they're, they're like, oh, well, could you change that? And you could, could you make it into a squish? Well, maybe all I have to do is erase the top part of the face and go in and make, make it into a squish face, right? Or something, you know? So with 2D, it's really easy to do stuff like that. So because it's easy to do, it happens all the time. One of the myths with uh, CG was they thought, oh, it'll make it faster, it'll make it easier um, because, well, it's a computer, it'll do it quickly, right? And what 
most people may not think about is that when you're doing CG animation, you're still going through every single frame and making sure that every single frame is exactly the choice that you made for what you wanted to do with um, your animation. There's no, oh, well, Maya will just take care of it for you. Um, Maya will give you good ideas sometimes, and Maya will, Maya will uh, uh, assist. And, and so I like to use it to get inspiration. I scrub through and I go, oh, well, this is what Maya wants. Now I'm going to go back and do it with purpose and do it right. Um, so there are no simple, easy, fast ways to animate unless you're doing cheapo stuff that doesn't look that good. So, so even with computer animation, there's always going to be a point where you want to go in and own every single frame and say, I drew that for a reason and put that there. And I didn't let Maya get away with it. I did it myself. Um, you know, if you want it to look a specific way. So. I see some other thoughts here. Are three D modelers considered animates? A good, good one, Morty Shark. Yes, if they animate. <laughs> um, yeah, usually, uh, what they'll do is uh, they'll sequester people into specific departments. You don't often find people um, uh, doing all in one. Uh, sometimes you have to. Uh, sometimes you have to be a generalist and do lots of things, but uh, a lot of the time um, you'll have the animation department and the modeling department, the riggers, the lighters. When I was in CG animation, uh, we would mix a lot, and that was one of the things at Rhythm and Hughes that you needed to be able to do well, is take a look at a rig and go, is it working? If it's not working, send it back, we got to fix it. Or um, the lighting on my scene doesn't look quite right. When I got that render, it didn't look quite right, and so I need to go back to lighting and say, hey, could you amp up the luminance or, you know, and I don't know if I was ever really all that good at it um, on Life of Pi. We had to do that a lot. And I'm like, yeah, it looks fantastic to me. And they're like, yeah, but there's too much green. And I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, on Alvin and the Chipmunks 3, three Chipwrecks, uh, there was a whole sequence that I, it was my, one of my sequences that was too amber. And so they bumped up the green on it a little bit. I'm like, yeah, great, good. I'm glad that that was your job and not mine because I wouldn't uh, have known the difference. So I got some uh, questions here. Um, do you do small thumbnails for do the rough keys? Yes, so I was showing that earlier. Uh, here are my thumbnails for this scene. So um, based on, I knew I was gonna do O'Malley or a cat that was like O'Malley. So based on that, I put, and based on the Richard Williams uh, sketches, I went ahead and thumbed out some ideas. So I thought, well, the idea was basically, well, what if there was a dog or something? And uh, so the cat looks over calmly and he goes, oh, whoa, there's there's a dog. And that's the essence of a take. Uh, the idea behind a character take is basically you're changing emotion. So um, what I wanted to do, let me get the Richard Williams back up here, is uh, rather than just do a generic take of because this is all stuff I created for the classes. Rather than just doing a take in place, I thought, well, let's create a little story. And the story is essentially um, that the cat looks over. I'll just play it now. Um, the cat looks over, sees a dog, and kind of goes, whoa. Uh, that was the idea that I started with. Um, but yeah, I started with thumbnails. Uh, you can look and see that my thumbnails don't really necessarily match what I had, but it's you can see that I thought, oh, well, there's the rest pose, the reaction. Um, you know, the cat looks, sees it, and then reacts into an anticipation, then an uh, exaggeration, then settles back down into the, the reset. So, yeah, it's a really good idea to do that with your animation ideas. Think about it this way. You're saving yourself lots and lots of checking it out this way. If you were to just go for it, and changing your mind midway, it's like, yeah, you know, um, you're going to be doing a lot of drawing and, and waste a lot of time and energy. So, uh, um, yeah, so that's one of the tools that you use when you're doing animation thumbnails is you're trying to work out the kinks in your scene so that uh, you don't spend a lot of time and energy um, with an idea that isn't going to work. And a lot of times you can look at your thumbnails and go, oh, yeah, it is working or it's not working. Uh, it takes some practice, you know, 
Um, one of the things I say about CG animation, again, that's not what we're talking about today, but in CG animation, I don't necessarily go through and do a pass quite like this, uh, where I sketch it out to this level, because I'm going to do that with my poses. I'm going to go in with the rig and sculpt the rig and play with it and see, well, what does it do? What can it do? What can it not do? And then I will do like, oh, I'll do a squish pose. I'll do a, a re reaction pose, exaggeration. And I'm working out my thumbnails in 3D in the environment. But with 2D, it's a 2D environment. That is my camera that I'm using, you know, the, with the thumbnails for my scene. So, and, and if you were on a production, they would give you this, some of this stuff, lay out the scene that you have, and you can't change that. So you already know the environment the character is going to be in, and uh, you will then create your poses within that environment. So yeah, so thumbnailing is, uh, I would go so far as to say it's not just recommended, it's essential in 2D animation. Or animation political question, here we go, you're going to set me off, aren't you? Morning Shark. <laughs> someone interested in animation, it's not set on one specific part of the career, is it better to practice more 3D work right now? It appears that 3D seems to be a trend and have a bit more opportunity at the moment. So what's the story? 2D, 3D. I always say this, can I make a living doing cutout animation? Can I make a living doing puppet stuff? Can I make a living doing 2D? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, the answer is, is until you did it, nobody else was doing it. When I started out in my career, there was no 2D animation in the world. Or well, not in the world. Um, they had just done a couple of really cool movies at Disney, Roger Rabbit and Little Mermaid. And, um, but the, the, the business was in a lull. They were considering closing down the animation department at, at Disney, of all things. And I got into it anyway. And not only that, but I worked without a break. Now I had some lulls where they put us on kind of paid furloughs and things. Uh, but I worked steadily in 2D for the entire time that 2D existed from 89 until 2001, uh, the 90s glory years that started in around 1989-90 and finished up in 2001. Um, I worked the whole time and there were lots of lulls and there were lots of problems uh, and lots of people trying to get in, trying to change jobs and things and uh, I worked consistently and I'm not saying that to be snotty or anything. I'm just saying I worked the whole time and there was no business for several of the years in between. And so um, I did it because there was no other option. It was maybe a little bit of luck that I happened when I did, that it was just starting out on a boom. But uh, I, I didn't know that was gonna happen when I started out. And I, I wanted to go to animation school. I didn't get into CalArts. Um, and uh, part of the reason I probably got in was because uh, they needed people and, but I started as a driver and I taught it to myself and I learned from the masters that I worked with, uh, Dale Beer being one of them. And um, then when the time came, I was ready. And that's because I loved it. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. There was no CG animation business at the time, so that there wasn't a choice. Uh, but when CG animation started to take over uh, and 2D was fading away, I saw it as an opportunity and jumped on that. So uh, eventually I ended up doing all three, uh, 2D, 2D character and 2D creature, sorry, 2D animation, CG animation with character and CG animation and creature effects, which is live action monsters and stuff, um, because I love doing it. And a little bit of it was luck. A lot of it was me just loving it so much I couldn't imagine doing anything else. So, okay, right now there aren't 2G jobs. Does that mean you don't want to do 2D because if you want to do it, you're probably already doing it anyway. A lot of my students have been doing it all along. A lot of people I worked with at Rhythm and Hughes in Creature Effects, uh, one of the best 2D animation people I've seen. I mean, I don't know about the animation, but as far as drawing goes, um, you know, shout out to somebody named Beth. I'm not going to say her last name, but uh, it's just beautiful work. Another uh, friend who went up to Vancouver, I haven't heard from in days, they, uh, just did remarkable work that Disney would have been proud. They would have snapped them up in a minute. Um, now they could easily work uh, for, um, what's his face, who did Klaus, um, I'm sorry, terrible with names, uh, but you know, I'm sure that he would have loved to have, them, have these people work for them now. Um, but if they didn't know to, how to do a 2D animation, then they couldn't get a job. And so now when they're hiring, I don't know, maybe they couldn't get that job. 
Uh, so I say do what you love. Um, I always worked to be able to do my hobbies on the side. And one of my hobbies was making 2D animated films of my own. And so even though I was doing 2D all day for Disney and DreamWorks, I also would go home and do my own stuff so that maybe someday, you know, I could say, hey, well, this is what I did. I mean, which is what I can do now. Uh, so um, anyway, so I hope that helps. It's a, yeah, I mean, you got to pay the rent. You got to do what you have to do. And if you have an act for doing 3D animation, you're probably going to be uh, in better standing because I think a hybrid is what's happening now and what's going to happen next. A hybrid between 2D and 3D, um, doing both or a little bit of both or having a knowledge of both. So it's a good idea to, to understand a lot of different disciplines right now. Um, but uh, you got to do what's best. There are some people who cannot draw. Well, there's still a place for them in motion graphics. There are some people who can't um, do CG stuff, you know, don't have computer minds. There's a place for them as well. So um, don't let it stop you, I guess, is the bottom line. Is don't, don't let it stop you from pursuing your dreams, but keep your eye on, you know, I got to do stuff uh, to pay the rent. And, and that's where the jobs are. So I hope that helps answer. Uh, confuse the different departments where you ask 3D modder. Oh, yeah. So sorry. Um, John Skull 3D modeler is somebody who builds the rig. A rigger would be somebody who puts the bones in the rigs. A lighter will light it. Um, an animator is going to make it move. I wonder about does Tim Burton do the actual animation or did he just create the characters? <laughs> Tim Burton um, probably doesn't do much these days, judging from the look of some of his films. I mean, he directs, so he organizes everything. And so he would hire this, he would have the studios working for him on his behalf. I tell the story all the time about uh, the Corpse Bride and somebody I know was a character designer. And uh, I actually, I think I heard this secondhand, so don't quote me, but apparently the story goes that they brought designs for the Corpse Bride up to Tim Burton and said, I've got a stack of different designs because people are usually very picky about these things. Um, which one do you like the best? And apparently Tim said to him, said, pick the one that you like the best. And then that's the design we're going to use for the character. So it's not as if Tim Burton went in and designed all those characters and, and did all that work himself. Um, and I don't think he did that for the Frank and Weenie cartoon either. I think he probably did it for the first Frank and Weenie, but even then I think he probably had some help. I don't know that he did the very first Frank and Weenie short all along. Look at the credits. That'll tell you. Um, it would be pretty astounding if he was able to pull that off all by himself. Um, so, um, animators are often unsung. That means you don't see their names a lot. They, I don't want to get into this too much, but in the 90s, um, they saw that 2D animators were becoming superstars and names were being attached with legends and genius and money was going to have to be paid to those people to uh, keep them happy or, or to reward them for a job well done and for bringing in the amount of business they were bringing in. It's like, well, if Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie get a lot of money for being in a film and their name draws people in, don't the animators deserve something too? And in CG animation, they tried to kind of quell that. So you don't hear a lot about CG animation superstars. They're out there and they, they exist and you do hear about them now and then. But um, as far as, oh, the Glenn Keane of CG animation, well, they, they kind of tried to keep that on the down low. So uh, uh, for whatever reason, and again, I won't go into that too much, but um, yes, they, uh, they are an unsung group. The animators are an unsung lot. Uh, we didn't, don't always get the credit we're due. And uh, it takes a mountain of people to, to make a feature animated film. Uh, so yeah, look at the credits, look at, look on IMDb and the animation credits for, I don't know, anything that you're interested in. And you'll see there's just dozens and dozens and dozens, sometimes hundreds of names. Um, so I think Jordan used to work on animation for Disney spec. He still does himself, but he seems to be directing now. Yeah. So he doesn't, uh, Tim Burton doesn't animate now, at least as far as I know. Uh, hope that helps. Well, and check, but apply for jobs and don't think you're qualified to be in the industry. So, um, well, yeah, JD, the rigors, I mean, even at Rhythm and Hughes, I remember they'd look at us and go, really, really, you honestly don't, you know, after all we've done for you, you don't, uh, um, 
we don't get any credit for this. Think about it, Life of Pi. Again, that's my last touchstone. But, well, I'm mean, think about something better, like in Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters, and we had a centaur, and they had to rig a centaur body that would work with a human torso that was a live-action plate and put the two together, and the riggers were responsible for making it look like a real horse um, when we animated it, and uh, they didn't get a lot of credit for that. So, yeah. And the actors are the names that do the work. Don't get more. <laughs> yeah, well, don't, again, let's not talk about Andy Circus and his bid to be uh, the, the sole source of uh, credit for Planet of the Apes and Lord of the Rings uh, for Gollum and, and uh, who was it? The lead ape. And was it? Couldn't have been. I don't remember the name. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's, that's a whole thing, um, which fortunately doesn't seem to have gone too far where he was getting credit for that. But. Uh, um, as far as uh, Morning Shark for the, the reality check, I don't know there, if you guys have seen this. There was a, uh, the, the, I think the rookies put out a web, web uh, article recently about the realities of why you're not getting hired to work. And it listed these hardcore facts about things um, that you need to do when you're applying for a job, specifically in CG animation. And um, the thing is, is... Uh, <laughs> nice the, the thing is is uh, a lot of those things are kind of harsh it's like well you know if you don't have this if you don't have that on your reel and what the article did really well what i think it, it, it was trying to say was if you don't take it seriously then you've lost some of your opportunities um i, I always tell this when in any given school i'm working in i say look so here's a group of us. We're all sitting here and we're learning animation, right? This is one animation class in Los Angeles, actually in Los Angeles County. I mean, there are schools all over Los Angeles that teach animation in different forms. Um, whatever one I'm in, it happens to be the best, but that's another story. But no, there, there are all sorts of schools that are teaching animation in California alone, in Los Angeles alone. Then you get California alone, then all 50 states, and then you start talking about Europe. Um, animation is being taught everywhere. And there are a handful of studios that are at least known for doing this sort of work. So uh, Disney, Pixar, Blue Sky, um, DreamWorks. And then for CG, it's like Lucasfilm and uh, Weta. And, you know, there's this ever-growing list of people who do this sort of thing. MPC, uh, the studios that will hire you to do these jobs. And everybody on the planet's trying to get in. And so... Um, you have to take it very seriously. The first lesson I learned when I was a kid was when I tried to apply, for, I applied for DreamWorks, uh, I applied for CalArts and uh, held it off to the very last minute, just said, oh, I'll just, you know, put it in the very last possible minute. And as a result, I did not get uh, picked to go to that school. And uh, my mom, you know, I was devastated. I was like, well, what do you mean? You know, I'm going to be an animator, right? And my mom said, why don't you write them and ask them what you can do to up your chances? And maybe you can apply next year if you're still really into it. And so I wrote them and uh, they were very honest and sincere. And they said, look, your stuff was fine, but uh, we had fulfilled our quota for the year. Uh, you need to apply first thing as soon as the uh, portfolio uh, is open as soon as the applications are, are being accepted and get in there and apply right away and then uh, we'll look at you then next year if you want to try again but you were just too late this year and it really hit me hard i was like wow just for that i did not get into cal arts and all my plans had to change and anybody who knows me knows that um, i then had to work hard labor jobs for the rest of the year and until i went to a community college and that was a real wake-up call my parents are like, well, you got to do something. <laughs> so I guess that's what you're going to do. So um, it's just a, just a, a wake up call is good it, to, to face reality and go, you know what? Everybody on the planet's buying for a small amount of jobs. And theoretically, uh, theoretically, there's another part to that too, which is there are plenty of jobs out there and they're always looking for new talent, partly because that's uh, it's cheaper to find new talent. And partly because um, it's uh, an enthusiasm thing. New people coming out of college, they know what's going on and they've been trained in the latest and greatest, often as not. So um, you just can't let that daunt be daunting. You can't let it get you down because um, you're going to find your place. Everybody does. 
and uh, I've seen people again and again just go against unbelievable odds and come out the other side as winners. And just think of it this way too, all you need is one foot in the door. And so, okay, so maybe I'm gonna not get the job that I dreamed of all my life, but I'm gonna get something. And then once I'm there, then I'll make the best of it, which is what I always did. Um, you know, I started out as a driver. And then when I went to an animation company, I made a parallel, uh, what do you call it, a lateral move. Uh, to be a driver at the animation studios. So if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have uh, access to the studio and all these great people and made friends with them and learned a lot. And as a result, was able to move up pretty quickly in my humble estimation. And other people did it too. They kept hiring drivers and the drivers would end up working in the animation. One person I worked with, I think the one who uh, I don't remember. Anyway, he ended up being a, a production executive at Disney eventually, so kudos to him. But he started out as a driver. I watched him schlepping stuff around on the hot days like we're having these days. I'm going, yeah, I feel your pain. I did it. Uh, but I didn't have to do it for too long. And then uh, was on to the next great thing. So, uh, yeah, so uh, the jobs are out there. Um, the entertainment business is always going to be a matter of timing and uh, some a little bit of luck. But I've said this so many times, people are probably sick of hearing it. But you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And then when the job does come up, you're ready. And you can kind of go, bam, here's my work uh, that I've been doing. And uh, my time was not idle. And then th th you have every chance for them to say, oh, well, okay, well, we'll give you a shot. Or we'll put you in another department and uh, make you a, like a lot of CG people I know, we'll make you a generalist because you've got so many skills and we need those skills. And then you, once you're in, you can try and prove to them, well, I can also do these other things that you guys desperately need right now. So give me a chance. So I'm a big fan of uh, the best you can do with whatever you got. That's kind of my credo. <laughs> and it has been ever since I won an award for that when I was a kid for drawing said, uh, the ward said best results for the least material or something like that it's like oh cool i'll take it anyway what do you mean when we were a driver well um i don't know if they I, well yeah they must still have that well certainly not now they don't when we're all kind of quarantined and locked down but um, uh, there was a time when an entry-level job was going into a studio and then you'd be their driver and it was basically a courier so I worked in an editing house on Highland and something right around the corner from another school where I worked and uh, um, I would they would say oh Scott we need to go pick up some stuff from the sound studio and bring it back we're having a session an editing session we need sound elements picture elements uh, one time they had me run off a soundtrack at a, a sound studio so I had to go to the sound studio pick up the soundtrack that they'd run off onto three quarter inch tape or something and then bring it back to the studio. And then they applied that and sat. And so my job was to go pick stuff up, drop stuff off. Oh, the film negatives are ready. We need them uh, to be sent to the client so they can keep them for whatever reason. And so I'd run to CSI in Hollywood and uh, pick up negative and then uh, run back to the studio and uh, pray that nothing happened between <laughs> CSI in the studio because that's the negative. That was the only copy of it. Everything changed once things went digital, like not too long after that. I started out at the very, very end of analog and uh, was interested in working with actual analog film. They kept saying, well, it's time to learn digital because it's over. Um, everything's going to be digital someday. And they were right. Um, but I was, I liked the ta tangible quality of film and that's why I got into editing and didn't stay very long. So anyway, that's what I was as a driver. And I used to run around Hollywood um, delivering things. Hollywood was a much different place back then, late 80s, early 90s. Um, a lot of people of ill repute would hang out. I'm just not going to go on too much about it, but people of ill repute would be hanging out on the streets um, soliciting business and uh, would want to talk to me and stuff. That's a, a whole era that's now long gone and Hollywood doesn't even look the same. It was flat when I worked there and now it's all built up buildings. Anyway, don't get me off on that. Um, so uh, I was college for five years. Oh, good for you, Martin Sharp. And sort of learned 3D. Good. 
So stuff that's for her is so very much experience to me. So, they, so my advice to you, Morning Truck, is just put your stuff out there. Get critiques now. Go on Facebook. Go on wherever you like to go, social media. Put your stuff out there and say, I would love comments. They'll be harsh. They'll be mean sometimes even. But they'll also tell you stuff that you need to know, which is, uh, which is good. And, and um, you're going to get that in the real world, so you might as well get used to it right from the start is having people say, hmm, your timing's off, you need to fix this. Or, oh, that model, why don't you try doing this? And that's how you learn. So um, even though it can be kind of hard if you've got a frail ego, which I definitely have when it comes to my art, um, I don't like to share stuff all the time. But when you have something that you're ready to share, put it out there and get feedback. And uh, they'll tell you it. They'll, they'll give you their honest opinions and sift through it, decide what you think is legit and what's just people talking. Um, don't share it if you're not ready to have it critiqued. Um, but yeah, they, they, the, the studios don't, they can't afford to bring people on and train. Well, here, let me say this. The studios can't, will say they can't afford to bring someone on and train them uh, when there are a dozen people out there who are ready to do the job right now. Um, but when I was hired as a driver for my first studio, they said to me, this is a position we want to hire you for. We are not hiring you with the intent of having you rise up. Traditionally in our company, we don't promote people. Well, I got promoted. The person who was a driver after me got promoted. The one after that did. The one after that did. So, um, you know, it's the rules in entertainment, in the creative arts as a business is do what you got to do and just make it happen. There are no, it's not like, uh, oh, you passed the bar, so now you're qualified to be a lawyer or something. It's do whatever you got to do to get in. Uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, cheat, you know, if, if that's what it requires. Uh, go in and uh, just you know, just make it happen any way you can. Look at Steven Spielberg, who got off a tram at Universal Studios and then set himself up in an office. We were talking about that last week, I think, or sometime. And, um, and then people were like, oh, you work here? And he's like, yes, this is my office. And then eventually it was, <laughs> just because he kind of left his way. I mean, you probably can't do that nowadays, but uh, it worked. And, and I know plenty of people who bluffed their way into saying, oh, I'm a director, and then got hired as a director. <laughs> and probably the, the same people didn't get to keep that job. But uh, you know, if you're realistic about your intentions and your dreams, uh, you can find yourself in all sorts of situations but um, my secret to my success was always sincerity I did not cheat uh, to the best of my knowledge if anybody's left there lurking and, and knows me well and uh, knows of an example of when I cheated um, yeah you can call me on it that's fine but uh, I didn't cheat I didn't schmooze networking when I when I met people who helped me in my career it's because we were friends because they liked me or I worked for them and like the, the people who told me at Disney, go in there and tell them what you're worth and don't and threaten to quit if uh, they don't give you what you want, um, which is how I negotiated a really sweet deal uh, for my contract back in the 90s. Um, well, those were upper echelon artists who I'd worked with, um, Pocahontas and other films. And they said they told me point blank. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. I was timid as a mouse when it came to that sort of thing. But they said, go in there and tell them what you're worth and we'll support you. We'll back you. Um, and that's how I was able to eventually start to move up the ladder a little bit. And then once I was at a certain point, I, I knew what I was worth and I knew I didn't have to compromise. And the business was very, very lucrative at that time. And I knew I could walk up the door and get another job in five minutes. In fact, I had people uh, hanging on the line waiting, waiting for me to decide if I wanted to work for them or not. And um, I, it sounds really snotty when I say it like that. It wasn't like that at all. It was, everybody was doing that. Well, a lot of people, if your job was up. Um, I just knew what I was worth at that point. I knew I didn't have to compromise. But before that, I worked as a driver. I was uh, cleaning up. I was, I was a mopping, mopping up floors at one place. And another place, I remember the boss came up to me. She said, oh, by the way, we need you to clean the toilets. They're overflowing and it's 80 degrees in there and we didn't have air conditioning today. So we just need you to take care of it. Well, I knew somebody else had been hired for the driver and I passed it on to them. Is that a cheat? Maybe it is. I don't know. But uh, anyway, I'm getting off the point. Um, so is it best to learn 3D and 2D? Yes. <laughs> the answer is uh, learn it all. If, if you've got the time, if you've got the interest, um, then you'll find uses for all of it. Uh, the question is, 
do you want to do those things? Because if you don't want to do those things, then um, probably you should spend your time and your energy and your money learning things that you actually want to do and not, um, and not spend time of learning something that you're not really that interested in. So, um, but if you have a knack for those things, if you're really adventurous and you're really, uh, interested in motion graphics in all its forms, which is kind of what I did, um, then I'd say, learn it all, have fun. What else are you going to do? You know, why not? Um, if you specialize in something, then you may become a master at that, but you also may be pigeonholed as only being able to do that. So, uh, so yeah, um, look at job application, you know, like, like you're doing. Um, look at what the jobs are out there and uh, tailor as best you can. But my recommendation, I always say this, is don't be a technology chaser in that you don't want to be that person who's constantly going, oh, well, now it's Cinema 4D, so I have to learn Cinema 4D. Oh, well, now it's uh, this website or this uh, software program, so now I have to go and learn that. And they kind of make a living at just learning the latest and greatest new thing and unfortunately uh, become sort of master of none. And I saw that a lot when CG animation was just getting started. And people were, I think they were kind of trying to trying to deal with the fact that they really didn't want to do any of it but as long as they kept were learning new software programs then they were able to put off the inevitable which is getting a job and, and just working all day long i don't know i don't know if that's the truth or not but i do know people who are tech chasers who are just constantly saying oh well did you see this new thing and this new thing and that new thing we got to jump on all these new things and the reality of it is as well, but what value is it going to be to learn all those things? If you are an animator, you know how to animate and eventually you just, um, you'll sit down and you'll either do a project or you'll do uh, something, you know, or you'll get a job. But um, if you're constantly just chasing whatever the latest and greatest technology is, you're sort of putting it all off. And you, at some point you need to get your feet wet. And at some point you're going to, um, be on the job and getting on the job training at which point uh, you'll probably have what you need for the next technology that comes along or they might train you at disney they i'm sorry at dreamworks they had no sooner just said oh you need to all learn maya because that's what we're going to be using then they said well we're going to take um, pdi and sort of blend which they had been using to do outsource for uh, to make shrek and stuff we're going to use their software now um, on this show and have it sort of a joint venture between our northern studio and DreamWorks proper, uh, the studio down south and where I worked. And so we all had to learn Emo. And then when Emo became Primo, which is currently, as far as last time I checked, that's their program they use software to animate, then they had to teach everybody that. Plus they would teach people how to do computer animation for a long time. My friend, one of my friends actually taught there, he was a teacher there. And that was his job full time was to teach anybody who was hired uh, in the specific um, formats that they were using and the specific uh, softwares that they were using, programs they were using, and just making sure they're up to speed and up to snuff with the proprietary stuff that they were doing at the studio. That was a full time job teaching people. Um, my friend did a nice job too. <laughs> but uh, so that tells you it's like, if they really care that much about it, at a certain point, they'll probably get you up to speed. If they care about you, they'll, they'll get you up to speed. So your, your mission, your goal, so says the animation elder, is just to get in there one way or another. Just get the job, get in there, and eventually um, you'll find your place. But you can't do that until you actually are in. And that is the hardest step. But what are some things you can be doing while you're waiting? making friends, getting to know people, uh, putting yourself out there as someone who's looking for a job in animation. I am amazed how quickly things have happened in my life when I just voiced my interests and said, um, for example, uh, I told somebody that I wanted to look into being a teacher. And next thing I knew, I had speaking engagements lined up. And um, it's one of those things where I talk about a lot where there are angels uh, again, not in a spiritual sense for me anyway, 
um, that there are people in your world uh, who will step up to the challenge. If you say, hey, I, I really want to do this or that, um, then they will uh, heed the call, for want of a better way of putting it. So, um, and then I always say, you know, and then you, you have to be respectful to those people and you have to be respectful to people in the future and pay it forward. That's just uh, something that I am very adamant about. But um, put it out there and see what happens. If you, again, what else are you going to do? It, it can't hurt. Um, so a lot of people I know end up getting jobs because they say, hey, I'm out of work. And on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or wherever you are at, and just putting it out there. And, and some people will say, oh, well, did you know so-and-so was hiring? And I'm like, oh, no, I didn't. Oh, and yes, and I worked there. And I'll put a good, in a good word for you because you're a nice person, you know, or whatever. So that's something to think about. Uh, uh, had a question about what's the exact difference between an animator and a 3D modeler, because you want to be the one who design the characters, styles, etc. You want to create styles, designs for vehicles and weapons. So um, you might be thinking more in terms of concept art at that point. This is for Drawn Skull, uh, who also, uh, Morning Sharks answered the question too. Um, you know, everybody wants to be the one who's making the creative choices. And the reality of that is, is uh, you know, it's not always possible. That's certainly not an entry level job. I happen to know, however, of a couple of people who were designing weapons and put them out there. And as a result, uh, they're now being used uh, for real and they actually made some cash off of it um, for this game. I don't know all the details, plus I don't want to talk about it too much. It's kind of outside the scope of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I know these people who design weapons, That's just they just do it for fun and uh, got picked up and got paid and now they get a, a percentage of the money whenever the thing is well they just we'll just leave it at that they get a percentage of it uh, they get a cut for having designed these weapons that is very unusual and and also my friend that i always talk about with uh, lucas the spider the uh, guy i used to work with um, who uh put that together and now you know that was wildly successful and now he's doing a show and stuff so you just can't bank on that that's the problem but the idea is, is you keep trying new and different things. And as a result of trying new and different things, eventually you find your success. You find uh, that one thing that was uh, your the, your entry into the world of whatever it is that you want to do. And you won't know until you put yourself out there and try things. But yeah, the likelihood is, is that you're not going to be hired to be someone making creative decisions right out of the gate. You probably have to work your way up. And Here's what I learned too, because I got some success really quickly in my career. Um, when you get success too fast, you don't appreciate it. And you also don't, you think you know what you're doing, but you don't. You think that you're really good and, and you're, you're like a genius, you know, that nobody's discovered yet. But really, you probably aren't. And you need to, to get your, uh, you need to do your time in the trenches, basically, is how they put it. And, and, it does two things. One, it makes you more respectful so that when you do finally get the position that you wanted, uh, you'll um, you'll appreciate it more. And then the other thing is that you'll just be better at it. You'll just, uh, you'll have learned what you need to learn. If I had gotten what I wanted when I wanted it, which was I wanted to be a 2D animator right out of high school, uh, <laughs> boy, I mean, I'm still, I probably couldn't get a job now, but um, when I first was out of school, I was terrible. I used to make animation cells. Uh, this is plastic sheets with painting on them. I did them like the Little Mermaid. And I thought, ooh, maybe I could try and sell them. And somebody even said, oh, if you got them, I'll take a look. It's bootleg animation cells of Little Mermaid. Why not? And then looked at them and went, yeah, I think I'll pass. And then I put them in my portfolio. And somebody finally told me, they said, don't put those in your portfolio. They're just not that good. And uh, in fact, my first... I always tell this story my first time trying to get a job in an animation studio i actually called in to see how i'd done and the person said to me um yeah you're terrible you suck and they didn't say you suck but but they basically said uh yeah you're not anywhere near the, the level of quality we need to be able to hire uh for for the job that we're doing which was a disney project and i got really offended well i was hurt my feelings were hurt and i said well is there anything else you can tell me you know to help me be better and so i could get a job in the future and they said no 
no, you're basically, you just don't have it. And um, it's funny because I tried painting cells later when I got the job and I was again, getting maybe a little bit cocky. I was in my early twenties and I was like, I could, I, you know, I got an animation gig. Maybe I can do a clean, a painting as well when there are downtimes. And I tried painting a cell and it was somebody who actually really liked me too. And he basically said, uh, yeah, that's all the help I need from you. Um, yeah, we're good. We don't need you to help us anymore, even though they were desperate for help. And what it taught me was, is like, oh, wow, my understanding of what my abilities are is vastly different from those of a professional who looks at my work and goes, oh, okay. And one of the things that I teach, you know, oh, you're, you're, you're actually good now or you're not actually that good. One of the things that I teach in my classes is how to see. A lot of my students can tell, will tell you that I show films that are not so good as a way of saying, I want you to be able to see the difference between this project and another project so that when you look at your own work, you can go, oh, well, my work is on the scale of, you know, is either really, really good compared to that stuff or is really not good compared to that stuff. Um, I'm not going to name the film, but you can take my class and you can learn all about it. But, um, but the idea that you, you're able to see the difference, you look at animation and you can go, oh, that's more successful and that's not quite as successful. That doesn't communicate quite as well and that maybe does. That's part of what I teach in my classes uh, by way of making it so that um, you evolve as an artist, even if you don't get any better at one thing specifically, but whatever it is you're going to end up doing, you can see it better. You can actually uh, visualize things and know that, oh, well, my work is not up to snuff quite yet, and I know why. I'm going to go back and fix it. Or, or this is just where I'm at, so I'm not even going to bother trying to get a job doing that, but I will still try and get a job. Just, I'm not going to aim quite as high as I was aiming before, so. So yes, Morning Shark, it's, it's all just, just keeping yourself out there and just keep trying trying different things and if you fall get up again and uh, that's been the secret to my success <laughs> yeah and and i always say this too is is um which is that uh, i don't know anybody who has failed who has worked hard at it everybody finds their place and it, even if it isn't um even if it isn't uh, exactly where you wanted to end up, then uh, it'll be the place that you were meant to be. And so for um, a drawn skull, is it possible to be a 3D modeler and a concept artist? Well, maybe, I don't know, prove me wrong. <laughs> I would say it's more likely that you would specialize in one or the other. And um, I would also say that concept art is probably one of the more desirable positions. And so, um, wanting to be a concept artist is like, I'm going to give that every single thing that I've got 101% or whatever cliche that is from the eighties, but you know, I'm going to give it everything I've got with the hopes that I can maybe get in as a junior concept artist who works with a senior, learn the ropes and eventually works my way up. At that point, you've spent your entire life trying to get to just that one thing. Remember again, what I've said, which is everybody on the planet wants that job. Um, I heard this about writing too. The reason uh, why everybody wants to be a writer is because it's the best job in the world. You sit and write at home or whatever. I mean, if you like that sort of thing. As a result, it's also the hardest thing in the world to get, uh, to make money at. So the same thing with something like concept. Everybody has dreams and wishes and hopes and yours are no less valid than everybody else's. But everybody has them and everybody wants that coveted position of being the one who sets the look of the film. So you're competing with everybody. And so you have to dedicate your 100% energies to doing something like that. Uh, same with a modeler. They don't necessarily need a lot of modelers because they've got so many characters in a show. So you want to get in there and be that one person who's going to be you know, the modeler for the show. Um, you're competing with everybody on the planet at that point. It doesn't mean you don't have as good a chance as anybody. It just means you have to take it so seriously to the point where you're going to have to sacrifice something and you might not be able to do both. That's all. That's that's all I'm saying. But do uh, um, do whatever you love to doing. As uh, others are saying, um, make your own stuff. 
and then you can do whatever you want make your own films and you're master and commander of the whole thing so uh <laughs> so these are and then uh, jd definitely uh attests the writing difficulties yet yeah. one well, jd who has had a measure of success so uh jenny well it's so nice to hear from an old friend and i uh, hope you're uh uh, happy with some of the things I, I don't drop names too often in here, but sometimes I drop names or talk about productions, and so hopefully I'm doing right by them. But uh, yes, friends joining me who have worked recently on films, as far as I know, I think Mary Poppins too, uh, 2D people, which proves there are jobs out there, um, but you're competing with some of the best in the biz. So um, just watch yourself. Uh, if you want to do this sort of thing, you have to step up to the plate. Um, and, and uh, you should be so lucky as to work with some of the best in the business um, that I have had the fortune of working with, some of whom are here tonight. So thank you. Thanks for checking in. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, I don't mind being a therapist. That's, that's one of the things that I like to do as part of these Twitch chats is talk to you about the realism, uh, realistic things that you can face in the biz and not only um, the realistic side of it, but also the positive side of some of that realistic stuff, because it's not all bad. Um, part of the reason I think I was successful was because I was naive and I didn't really think about what I was up against. And um, as a result of not thinking about it, I just did stuff. Nobody told me I could be an animator. I just did it. And nobody told me I couldn't be an animator. Well, eventually they did, but uh, they are, um, you know, it's just, I just kind of did it and then eventually found my path uh, again through a lot of lucky breaks. Um, a lot of it, I think, was because I was nice. Uh, I, mean, I was eager and hopeful and, uh, you know, I, I would find people who were uh, strong workers or just nice people or people I could talk to and then I would talk to them and then when the time came they'd say oh well I want this one uh, I think speaking of which <laughs> Drew Mercer Memories I, I think one of the things that happened that one of the reasons I ended up being invited to leave DreamWorks is because I'd stopped caring and I wasn't interested in them anymore and I wanted to do something different and I was uh, getting complacent and uh, I think the company they could see that and uh, I was looking for an opportunity to go off and do something different, but I was scared because I had a cushy job. And um, so the company did me a favor, I say this all the time, in uh, inviting me to, to take, take other opportunities as, as I could. And it made all the difference in the world. I ended up uh, working on Life of Pi, finishing off my animation career with that one, which is one of my proudest moments. And it never would have happened if I had stayed where I was. So, so I try to talk about the realities of things, but also frame it as, but it doesn't have to be a negative thing. You can look at it any way you like. It's a sad thing to lose your job. It's a scary thing, but it's also, every time I lost my job or, or faced something like that, I ended up going on to something even bigger and better. And that's one of the things I'm doing now, which is teaching is a result of my studio shutting down and then going, well, no, what am I going to do now? And what I ended up doing was uh, teaching. So, um, so uh, <laughs> invited to leave DreamWorks. I just say that as a polite way of saying I got laid off. Um, basically, it's a long story and I shouldn't talk about it. And I, I don't think I will tonight because it's not, it, it's way off the mark. Uh, but basically, um, things changed at DreamWorks. Uh, quickly when it went, became a CG animation studio. And then it changed again uh, once certain projects were going. And I just was going through a lot of stuff in my own personal life and just didn't have the heart for it anymore. I just wasn't as into it as I needed to be. And I think the studio saw that. Um, and slowly but surely, I, I kind of invited myself out of a job there. But uh, they basically, um, said to me, they said, well, we see that you don't want to work on this film and you're making all these demands. And, you know, they're probably just fed up with me at that point. And my, I, I was kind of a, I don't know, I had a rebellious side. I, if Jenny, if you're still out there, I don't know if you remember, but there was a, a 
the question of a poem that was been written about the cleanup department. Yeah, I wrote it. <laughs> what of it? Um, so I would, you know, I, I was very passionate. It's because I cared. But then all of a sudden, I realized I didn't care anymore. And I mean, I think we're talking about stuff that's like twenty or twenty-five years ago, twenty years. And suddenly, I didn't care so much, and uh, my passion was gone. And I was much more interested in having time at home and working on my own stuff. And I felt like I'd gone about as far as I could go. And I think they picked up on that. And they're like, "Well, we want people here who are really excited and really want to do this stuff that's in front of them and not dream about." something else and so um that's why i say they invited me to leave they also invited me to stay another six weeks or whatever it was to finish off a short work with wolf Finn, which was awesome and kathy zelensky who's uh, an amazing animator still a friend um so it, you know it was about as amicable as you can be with a breakup i'd been there for 10 years or something and uh um you know and it would left me to lurch financially and other things um at, at first, <laughs> but then again, I don't want to talk about this too much, but, um, but it worked out great. Trust me. And then I ended up going into creature effects and finding a new life and career and home there and uh, making lots of great friends and people who I'm still friends with and it, it all worked out great. So don't be afraid. Do not be afraid of, of that. Uh, you'll find your place eventually if you're cool and if you try. So anyway, um, Let's see. <laughs> no problem. I mean, I've said all this stuff before. Go watch one of the other videos. You'll see. I've, I've been very candid about so I don't name names. I don't uh, try not to name specific stuff. I got in trouble once for uh, talking about stuff when I signed a NDA. Um, and so I don't do that anymore. And, and it's and wise. I don't want to talk trash about stuff. And I, I don't talk trash. I just sometimes I get a little too honest and tell things um, that are not relevant. The point of it is, what I'm trying to say is, is just uh, keep at it and keep loving what you do and doing what you love. That's the secret. There's nothing else you um, really need to know and be cool, be a nice person. Are you interested in games at all? Unfortunately not. That's one of my weaknesses is that uh, I don't play games. And uh, as a result, I'm not up on games. And I, if, if I wanted to be competitive in the industry, I would have to be uh, interested in those things so that's one of my concessions to being older is that i um, don't keep up with games and don't know a lot about them uh, however the good news is is if you're interested in that sort of thing there are other streams in uh, the cg spectrum stream live streaming feed you can look at those uh, at the end today there'll be a list um, they're on the website uh, so other people are twitching and talking at length about games and um, we'll answer questions or they're thrilled to talk to you about this stuff um, so if you're interested in games there is another stream that might be better for you um, but yeah that's I mean it's a failing of mine I wish that I could be more interested but that's one of the reasons I left the, the, the industry is I realized that things were changing and moving on and I wasn't gonna be able to keep up with it and I'm like give somebody else a chance let them have their turn and uh, and I'm very excited about games. I like to watch them. And, and I love it when my students share new stuff with me that they've um, been playing or that I just should know about. It's uh, fun to just check out new stuff. But I don't actually play them. I've never worked in them. And um, that's probably not going to change anytime soon uh, since I'm semi-retired from doing production at all. So, yes, there is that. And let's see, we've got a, about 20 minutes here. So just uh, if there's anything anybody's interested in asking, um, you guys are doing great, I appreciate it. So, but uh, fire away, we got about 20 minutes. Getting a BFA in film production, that's cool. Hey, I got mine in film. Um, my BF, my bachelor's was in film. And um, I once asked somebody on the job, I said, all right, level with me. When I handed you my resume, when I was fresh out of college, did the fact that I had a bachelor's in film have any bearing on my getting the job? Was that why you guys hired me? And he kind of laughed and he's like, no. He says, we hired you because you were a nice guy. And the fact that you went to college meant that you were cool uh, in that you, you finished what you started, you know, you graduated and everything. Now that was for a driver job, right? I knew people who 
were hired fresh out of college uh, to do other things and they were qualified for those things and then they um, they got jobs in those things so that was one experience um, all experiences are different but he was like no we hired you because you were a nice guy and we knew you'd do the job and that's that was enough for us uh, once we interviewed you and stuff this is also a long time ago this was in the early 90s I think somewhere around there so anyway but uh, so see so yeah college just just get it you get filmmaking skills learn everything learn all you can um, take every every class that you have available and uh, and the rest will fall into place oh I've definitely heard of Cuphead how could I not I've heard of Cuphead yes everybody um, who loves 2d animation knows about Cuphead and I've never played it though, and I've never actually seen. I, I, my understanding is the game itself is not really all that overwhelming, but uh, but the look of it, yeah. If anybody hasn't heard of that, you need to jump on it, and check it out. It's so much fun to watch. It's very uh, Betty Boop, I guess, or Fleischer is, is another way of putting it. Um, but I uh, really appreciate it. And there's a sequel coming, as far as I know, right? You guys again probably know more about this stuff than I do, but. I thought I heard somebody mention a sequel and it's in the works. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great. And, and again, it's proof, you know, people are like, oh, well, there's no 2D. Well, then all of a sudden Cuphead comes out and suddenly there's 2D again. And uh, so, um, you know, never say never, right? And, and keep doing what you love. Obviously, there was a market for it because it was successful enough that I believe they're making a sequel and people were really interested in the look of it. Hey, how'd they do that? Why do we... How did they make that look? Um, and then just imagine you've got a whole portfolio of 2D stuff and you're like, um, I can do that. <laughs> so uh, that's why I say is you can't wait for things to be made available. You have to um, just follow your passions and do what you love to do. And, and, and like I said, don't worry so much about t chasing technologies. It changes so quickly and it, it's going to keep changing. But if you understand how animation works, if that's something you're interested in, then you'll uh, you'll be at the forefront when people are like, oh, well, can you animate? Yes, yes I can. Can you animate in 2D? Probably. <laughs> can I animate in CG? Yes, definitely. Can you do it in Cinema 4D? I'll let you know on Monday after I've spent a weekend learning. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I've heard conflicting things about Cuphead. I don't know if it's easier, hard, or fun, but uh, um, but I've heard great things about it in general. And again, just the fact that it exists at all is symptomatic of uh, where we're at in the business, where anything is possible, so be ready. <laughs> um, I always quote Leo Biscagula, who used to say, uh, um, our business policy is we answer phone calls on or before the very first ring. I think about it a minute. It's like, well, you you get um, the idea, which is I am prepared. Uh, I will be prepared for whatever happens next, um, if I can at all be. So that that's all that means. And, and you can't prepare for everything. And again, that's one of the reasons I got out of the, the business is I'm like, okay, you know what? I've gone as far as I can. I can't keep up with this. I think the last thing that uh, I was up for I was up for a bunch of stuff and um, um, they wanted me to be a supervisor in Toronto and they wanted me to uh, supervise, I think, or maybe just work in at Weta, um, Planet of the Apes. I think they just had job openings there. And then somebody said, I, they were like, oh, you can come work on Paddington. I could help you get a job there if you want to. And I just was like, wow, after Life of Pi, it just didn't seem like a good fit. Well, the actual job that I was up for was, I think, Iron Man 3 and just doing secondary stuff that finish off the film. And I'm like, man, I just, it's the same feeling I had when I was at DreamWorks. I'm like, I kind of feel like I've done all this and I'm not evolving and growing and I really want to keep earning a living, <laughs> but my heart just wasn't in it. And um, when it didn't work out for me in Iron Man 3 or any of those, uh, I wasn't too disappointed. The other one, the going up to Toronto to supervise on, I think it was a, it was Peter Pan. They were going to do Peter Pan again. And I was not surprised to find that the film didn't do so well. Um, but I don't wish ill on anybody. I mean, if I had worked on it, I would have wanted it to do well. Uh, I'm just saying I wasn't that 
surprised when it didn't do well. And I'm awfully glad I didn't go up there to work on it because uh, right on the eve of deciding I was going to move to, to uh, it wasn't Toronto, it was uh, Quebec, uh, Montreal, sorry. Uh, right on the eve of deciding that, oh, I guess I'm going to have to take this job because nothing else is coming. And, you know, well, it won't be that big a deal. I, I'm sure it'll be fun. So I guess I'll go ahead and take this gig. Um, then I got my first official teaching gig full time and took that instead. And it worked out very nicely. So I just took a gamble and followed my heart that time. And it paid off in spades. I'm still doing it. That was I don't know, 2013, I think, 2014, something like that. And um, and becoming a an instructor was a leap of faith, uh, but it was following my heart once again. I'm like, well, I just know I can't do the other things I was doing, and there's got to be a place for me somewhere, so I'll see if I can start paying it forward. And it worked out uh, very well, I might say. I really, really enjoy it, and it's been real good to me, so I'm very happy to uh, to be able to say that. So, um, yeah, so taking opportunities when they arise, following your heart, um, being patient. That's another one. I know it's hard sometimes, especially when you haven't gotten your start yet. But uh, uh, I had to be incredibly patient while I was working as a driver and dreaming of being something else. Didn't think it was possible to be an animator yet, but definitely knew I wouldn't stay a driver. But meanwhile, week after week after week, um, I would schlep around. Los Angeles. I got to go to Gene Kelly's house. That's a fun one. Um, they were doing a spot with him shortly before he passed away. They uh, were doing some big expensive ad phone for phones, I think. And they had a gift for Mr. Kelly, the studio. So they were like, you got to drive this out to Gene Kelly's house. And I was like, well, what? And um, they said, don't lose it, whatever you do. And not that I never lost anything. I was one of the best drivers they ever had. They told me so. Um, and that's one of the reasons they didn't promote me is I was too good a driver. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I got to go out to Gene Kelly's house out in um, Beverly Hills and dropped, I went up to the front door and a woman greeted me. I don't know who it was, if it was his wife or a housekeeper or something, but I said, I've got something for Mr. Kelly. And she's like, and who exactly are you? I said, well, I'm working for this company. I won't name it, but um, she said, oh, hold on, let me let me go ask somebody who I think I'll know. And so obviously she went in and asked Mr. Kelly. And then she came back and she's like, hi, he smiled. And I didn't get to go in, but I did get to stand outside and look in at the house. It was very quaint, very cute, much smaller than you would think. It was by no means a mansion or anything, but a very nice house, nicely decor. And it was right in the middle of Beverly Hills, if I remember right. And uh, she just said, oh, I will be happy to take that upstairs for him. Thank you. And I'm like, thank you. And off I go. That's my Gene Kelly story. But it was fun. I mean, I was new in town. I was just getting my start. So it meant a lot to me. I was pretty excited. I got to tell my friends I got to go to Gene Kelly's house and stand on the porch and deliver something as if it was a telegram. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh, but I also got to help work on the commercial that he was in and got to work on dailies and stuff. And uh, that was pretty exciting. So anyway, brush with fame. Uh, but but it was a lot of patience, a lot of waiting around for my chance. And uh, everything I ever wanted to do, I did. You know, big premiere, rap parties, and rides in limos, and meeting celebrities, and all that nonsense, which you think matters so much at the time, but ends up being the least of it. That's the least of what's the fun of the job. The job is what's the fun part, not all the clits that um, can sometimes go with careers in, in Hollywood. So just had to toss that out there. So concept artists, the ones who create the style of the characters. Yes, they look, uh, John Skull, they do the look of things. And you'll want to talk to, if you're interested in any classes, um, just make an inquiry uh, to CG Spectrum. They'll hook you up with the right people and uh, you can take classes. Uh, I mean, if you're interested in this, but yeah, the, the, the concept art um, would do things like what the characters look. There's a, a person does a stream on concept art you might want to check it out here at CG Spectrum on, I think on Mondays I don't remember what day it is but uh, just check the schedule and you can learn a lot more about concept art from Brandon who is doing the uh, concept art twitch streams so that's it's always a good one because he draws things uh, that he's working on 
and you get to see it. Uh, some of it's just really amazing artwork. Um, you get to see it going from inspiration to completion on his Twitch streams. So if you want to know more about concept art and ask questions specifically from somebody who's actually done it, I mean, he did it for a living, as far as I know, uh, um, certainly he's qualified to, um, then that might be a good one for you to sit in on and see, you know, is this something I want to pursue or not? You know, might, it's worth, definitely worth checking out and it doesn't cost anything for these streams, right? So, um, so, the question, yeah, patience is a big factor. If you're afraid of doing a job that you don't want to do, um, think about this. My friend, one of my mentors, one of the many wonderful mentors I had, uh, we would talk late into the night and I would ask them questions because I was young and, and eager. And I asked a friend of mine, I said, who was a, I think he was the effects lead to, well, I'm talking 2D animation effects, not uh, as the kind of effects we do now, digital, but um, back when you used to draw effects by hand. And I said, so, Paul, level with me. What is the best job that you ever had? In all the jobs you've ever had, what was the best one? And he said, you want to know, really, honestly? When I was a janitor, <laughs> it's just because I could walk around at night in the school and mouth off all I wanted to. I could sing, run around, do whatever I wanted, curse, because that's important. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and nobody could say boo to me because I was all by myself in the school. He says, that was the most fun I've ever had in the job. And I loved it. I paid well. And it, I got along great. So, you know, it's it's one of those things you don't know until you know. And uh, I mean, my favorite job without question has been as a teacher. Um, but boy, when I was doing production, I loved it with my heart and soul. Just think being paid to breathe life into characters. And sometimes like in my CG work, you get to have a lot of say in the animation. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you're just uh, hands for hire. But sometimes you actually get a lot of say, uh, Cirque de Freak, uh, those little mutant characters I worked on. I mean, that's my stuff. Uh, um, whatchamacallit, the uh, Cabin in the Woods, the Phantom. I, I take full ownership of that, even though other people worked on it after I moved on to other things and they may have, no, I finished that one if I remember, but if you see the Phantom in, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, Cabin in the Woods, I just, it's all me, I did it all. And I mean, I had a supervisor who worked with Matt, but he didn't, he didn't press too hard on me. He let me do whatever I wanted. He was very happy with my work. And then the director, I believe was Todd Shiflett, the director of animation. I mean, um, he let me do it. He's like, it's great. Yeah, just keep going, finish it off. And same with, he, he and I worked together on uh, uh, Vampire Assistant, Cirque du Soleil, whatever it's called. But I, the movie, whatever, I hadn't even seen it. I've seen years, but but I got to do a whole section with these little mutant creatures and just said, go for it. And when do you get to do that? And it was just wonderful. It's an awesome job. Best summer of my career, maybe, as far as animation production goes. And then El Dorado, I really enjoyed working. That was one of my favorite, favorite productions to work on. I just absolutely loved working on that every minute. And um, um, it's a film that I would just like, oh, let's do it again. Let's do more. So you know i've had a lot of high points in my career but right now teaching has turned out to be one of my favorite things it's just so satisfying to to pay it forward and give other people their and their chance and get to see other people do what they love doing in the same way that i got to do for so many years so that's my take on it i'm gonna wrap this up uh we have um which one was the Phantom? So in, in Cabin in the Woods, they go into elevators um, um, towards the end of the film when they figure out, I don't want to spoil her, but they figure something out. They go down in elevators and they meet this pinhead looking thing. And then there's another, they turn and look at another elevator and they see this Phantom and he's going like this up and down the, the screen. He's mostly missed. That's probably why they let me do whatever I wanted with it. And um, But you get a good look at him and he screams. He's like, ah, and his mouth gets really big. and. Um, so he floats up to the, the glass and he goes like this with the glass and then I think he scares him or something and I did all that and then I he's in the movie later but um, you don't see too much of him and then you see him in an elevator and he's just one of a million ghosts um, but uh, 
uh, yeah, so I did that. I worked a little bit on the Dragon Bat, and then we did the Purge, where it's all the elevator doors open up and all the monsters come out. We all worked on that. I did the things flying around in the air, and it body gets this is awful it's really off topic and we're almost out of time but anyway so yeah i did a lot on that um but uh yeah so be patient and keep um keep focused keep doing what you want to do even if people don't tell you tell you don't you know even if they don't give you permission to do it like somebody earlier said make your own short films and then prove that you can do it and uh you know watch people suddenly go hmm, well if you can do that maybe you can do this for me and, and maybe work on our production and that's the best possible way of getting in on something is is oh we saw your work online and we want to uh, hire you to to keep doing that for money for us um, yay but short of that um, then you can uh, get in through friends you can get in through uh, acquaintances recommendations that's another thing too and this is... oh well I'm very glad that you've enjoyed uh, this time morning shark. I appreciate you being there. I appreciate everybody who's been there this evening uh, It's wonderful when people chime in and ask questions and uh, sometimes talk to each other too in the chats uh, You guys are welcome always to, to, to share things with each other too. That's always helpful um, But I will be back again next week same time same place uh, if you have any Specific things that you'd like me to talk about. I'm always happy to focus on things too uh, I'm 90% of what I talk about ends up being business stuff, uh, which I think is really valuable too. So um, I'm happy to talk about that. But if there's any technical stuff you want to know, I can bring that for next time. I'll probably work on this another week. Uh, they just have it running in the background. But I have other scenes too. You can look at my other videos if there's something you're interested in that I've been working on. And then I'm going to probably start a new scene here pretty soon. Uh, this is new to you. We haven't shown this one, but I'll work on it for a while until people start getting bored of it. But I want to finish this off and clean it up. I think it's going to be really charming once it's done, uh, hopefully. But anyway, this uh, kind of wraps it up for me for today uh, for Twitch. Remember CG Spectrum, CG Spectrum. <laughs> See the uh, login if you're interested in finding out more about uh, the school and or if you want to find out more about other uh, Twitch streams. I'm going to be posting that here in just a, a minute. Be post anywhere throughout the week. Um, yeah, so these, I don't, but these uh, Twitch streams go pretty much every day and there are different disciplines that they talk about. Um, but I'm here doing, talking about 2D specifically and my version of uh, the business, you know, interesting things. Um, I do this every week at this time for two hours. Uh, so uh, and then I post my own stuff on YouTube, but I'm not gonna go on. You can look me up if you're that interested. My name is Scott Claus and uh, I'm talking about 2D and uh, I would love to see you, anyone who'd like to drop by, I'd love to see you again next week. It's been great hanging out with you. Any questions, comments, think about them. You're gonna ask me uh, during the week, uh, next week. Uh, but otherwise, check out CG Spectrum if you're interested and uh, hope to see you again. And thank you again for a great session. I will uh, talk to you next time. Cool, bye.